Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Blessed to you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed are you who believe that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. Hello and welcome to Close Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. But who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Who are you? Who am I? Who are we that God should so love us? Who are we that God should send us his only son? And who are we that God should allow his son to suffer and die so that we might have life eternal? Those are questions, and they're real questions. They're real questions about how we see ourselves in the sight of God. There are a number of things going on in this gospel. Obviously, this is a gospel of the visitation, where Mary visits Elizabeth. Elizabeth, her kinswoman, was an old lady, thought to be barren. Her husband, Zechariah, they had given up. Then she finds that she's with child. And then, when Mary walks in the room, the baby is the first to recognize. The baby within her womb left for joy. The baby was John the Baptist. It was his cousin. And even in utero, John the Baptist recognized who the Savior of the world was. John the Baptist was a miracle recognized in the salvation event. And our recognition of who we are in the sight of God and why God should even care about us. Most people tend to think that God loves us because we're good. God doesn't love us because we're good. God loves us because he's good. And we only think that the times where we're good and we do everything, that's the only time that God cares about us. And if we do something bad, God wants something bad to happen to us. And we think God is punishing me because I did X, Y, Z. How many of us, how many of us act that way? How many of us with our own children when our children do something bad, how many of us want to do something worse to them? How many of us want to punish our children in such a way that we destroy their lives? We don't do that. We want our children to have consequences and hopefully pray God, learn a lesson, and not repeat the same thing. But if we, with all of our sins, now to give our own, don't push us off on God. Who am I that my God should send a Savior to me and care about whether or not I end up in heaven or whether or not I end up in hell? Who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm insignificant. Look over the course of human history. and We say stuff like, how does God keep track of all these people? Don't worry about it. 
He's God. You're not, I'm not. He's God. But the understanding that God desires our salvation. And Elizabeth said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? I'm so blessed. And that's just a visit from his mother, let alone the son visiting us and visiting the world and dying for our salvation. Christmas is about gratitude. Not about getting, it's about gratitude. Well, let's talk about the whole Christmas event. You know, when we say a savior was born into the world, and I think a lot of people nowadays look at the world and go, Phew. I'll tell you what, you know, we're digging a hole with the backhoe here. I mean, we are steadily slouching towards Gomorrah. I wonder how much longer God is going to put up with all our foolishness. And I think, you know, God is doing this and God is doing that and we're just not paying attention and look at all these tsunamis and hurricanes and floods and tornadoes and look at all this stuff. Is that God? I don't know. I'm in sales, not management, okay? But the reality is, is that when we look at the things that, 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 that go on and we try and figure out the mind of God. And so, if you're going to send a Savior today, where would you start? Hey, you want to start over in the Middle East and get groups like Boko Haram and ISIS and Al Qaeda to quit killing people en masse? You want to start in Northern Ireland? You want to start in Somalia? You want to start with the nuclear arms race? You want to talk about the, the migrant crisis? You want to talk about poverty? You want to talk about human trafficking? You want to talk about drugs and losing a generation of young people? Where do you start? If there's one, if there's a savior to come to this world, I mean, where do you start? And. You know, the same was true in the time of our Lord. Obviously, it was different circumstances, but people were being sold into slavery. Infant mortality was rampant. People had no medical care. Forty years old was an old person in that day and in that time. There were, you know, there were plagues that wiped out whole villages and people. There were volcanoes that they did not get out of the way of that destroyed. So. You know, there were all these things that they were worried about. And so now the world waits for a Savior. And they've been waiting 4,000 years for a Savior. Can you imagine when they hold up this little baby and say, Behold, the Savior of the world. You kidding me? That's what we've been waiting for 4,000 years? And you got a baby? who knows when he's dirty and when he's wet and when he's hungry. And you're going to tell me with all the stuff we got going on in this world that that's the answer to all of our problems? I'm sure at the time of the birth of our Savior, that salvation event appeared to make no sense whatsoever. Why didn't he send a military general who could have stopped all these people who were enslaving people? <clears throat> Why didn't he send a man of science who could help interpret all this stuff and help us be free from being victims of the elements? Why didn't he send a great orator, someone who was so eloquent and someone who convinced everyone to turn themselves and to follow God and stop their idolatry? Why didn't he send someone like this? What are you doing sending us a baby? Well, you think about it. God didn't send someone to save the world. Because if he sent someone to save the world, then we all go to heaven, show's over. God sent someone to show us how to save ourselves. God sent someone, a man like us in all things but, but sin, someone who is to be the way, the truth, and the life. 
In other words, you want salvation? You want to see the face of God? You want to live forever, for all eternity in the presence of God? Look at his boy. He's just like him for the world. He's going to tell you what to do. He's going to tell you how to act. He's going to tell you how to treat people, how to forgive, how to get over it. He's going to tell you what's expected of us. God didn't send him so that he would save us instantly. He sent him to show us how to be faithful and to follow him and to work for our own salvation. We're only saved by the grace of God, but we avail ourselves to that grace when we imitate God. And that's really the mystery of this salvation event. The mystery of the salvation is event is, is to know that if he's here, he's the Savior. Show's over, everybody go to heaven. No. He's here. He's the Savior. Now you want to get there? Follow him. And that's our purpose. You know, I remember, you know, a few shows back, we were talking about the beginning of Advent and talking about the end times and that whole salvation event. Yeah. They told us how to get there. They told us where we want to be. And now the birth of our Savior is saying, this is how you do it. He didn't do it for us. If everybody's going to be saved, get on with it. This world is not that much to brag about, okay? The human condition and the struggles and the sickness and the illness and the death and the divorce and the disease, this isn't anything to brag about. If there's a place called heaven, I want to get there. But I got to work for it. That's what I'm doing here. And the other thing is, is we talk about building the kingdom of heaven here on earth. We talk about getting to that point that earth has changed. You know, how do you do that? Let's go back to this whole salvation event. Look at the problems. Where do you start? You start here, you start there, you start anywhere. I start here. You start here, right here. That we start to conform our hearts, our minds, our will to that of the Savior. When that happens, God, wouldn't it be nice to walk out on your city streets anytime, day or night, and to think there's no one there who wants to harm you? There's no one there who wants to rob you? There's no one there who wants to inflict some type of violence or assault upon you? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we lived in a world where he'd say, I'll do that for you. Don't worry about it. And it's done. We don't have to have legal contracts. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we lived in a world where, oh, you're hungry? Here, I'm going to help you. No, you're not going to drink with the money. I'm going to help you. I'm going to feed your stomach. I'm going to feed your soul. I'm not going to feed your habit. Wouldn't that be wonderful to live in a world like that? Those are all the things that this salvation event represents that we're getting to that point of trying to change the world. So why a baby? We'll talk about that baby when we come back. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need and also your financial support. We are donor driven and that would is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the Gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. Blessed are you who believe that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. 
Hello and welcome back to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Byer, your host, and glad that you can join us. Blessed to you who believe that what the Lord has spoken to you would be fulfilled. In that context, she's giving the Blessed Mother her due. That here's a young girl, she just trusted. She trusted that God was going to make good on his promise. She's 12 years old, angel of the Lord comes, says, guess what? I mean, Lord, whatever you want, I want. Mary's proven herself faithful, but blessed are we who have believed what the Lord has spoken to us would be fulfilled. That promise, that promise of what the Lord has spoken to us is what drives us as we prepare to celebrate this Christmas. And what the Lord has spoken to us is, is that anyone who believes will have eternal life. And when we talk about believing, I use this example all the time, you know, a lot of people get married and say, I do, and then they don't. Well, but I said I do. Do you believe that you, oh yeah, I love you. Well, that love, over which we say I do, is not something that is begun and end at the altar. That love is something that we do every day of our lives, and when we do that and when we work on that every day of our lives, then we have the opportunity to celebrate it 50, 60, 70 years later and pray God for all eternity. And those of us who believe that the promise of the Lord will be fulfilled means that every day we wake up and we begin that process. We begin that process of believing that God has asked us to gear our lives towards being pleasing in His sight. Christmas. God, what a wonderful time. And so many of us celebrate Christmas in a way that just pleases God beyond belief. Our generosity, our concern, our compassion, our care. We do such a great job. A reminder, I don't want to be ugly, but guess what? Those children who we want to make sure have something to play with on Christmas morning, they got 364 more days until next Christmas. Those people who want to make sure that they're fed and they're warm and they're taken care of, they got 364 more days until next Christmas. And all the people who need a friend and a place to come into out of the elements, all the people that we reach out to, it should become part of our way of life. And understanding that every person bears the responsibility. One of the things that I'll always remember, and usually the people who have the least do the most. The people who have the least know what it's like to do without. And when they get a little, they always cut it in half. The people who've had it and had it all their lives, they don't understand what it means to be hungry, what it means to have your water turned off, your lights turned, they don't understand that. The people who've enjoyed good mental health, they don't understand what it's like to suffer, hearing voices and things. The people who've always had a family to love them, they don't understand how some people can be alienated, or some people have been abused, or some people have been taken advantage of, even by the very people who are supposed to love them. They don't understand. And so, if everybody, if everyone saw it as part of my responsibility, and part of my response to that salvation event, if everyone saw it as my responsibility to help someone in need, wouldn't it be great? July 5th, 1975, 
I was the first person in this diocese to bring a refugee a family from Vietnam who were in Fort Chaffee, and I was the first person to bring in refugees. I was a grad student in 1975. I mean, I was, I was in school, not working, you know, and not, not much money. By the grace of God and a shoehorn and a wing and a prayer, I sponsored a family of six, okay? With the money that I had, I found a little apartment just south of the university. It was only two bedrooms, but luck. They were, they were dry, they were safe, they were warm. Six people. Then I take them to, to the grocery, mark, uh, grocery store. I'm not familiar with the Vietnamese culture. I, you know, I didn't go buy cereal and you know, Doritos for them. So I was gonna, here, let's go to the store, get what you need. So we go to the store, I don't know what I spent. Wasn't that much, it certainly wasn't gonna last them very long. But we got back to this little apartment and they opened up the bag of rice and took half the bag and put another bag. They had a watermelon, they cut it in half. They had a head of lettuce, they cut it in half. What are you doing? They had friends who were also refugees who were arriving in town tomorrow and they didn't know who their sponsors were gonna be. They took half of the little groceries that I bought them and they put those on the side because they were gonna make sure that their friends who were coming had enough food when they got here. Pretty cool. These people went on to do well. They eventually owned their own home and, and, and did okay. But there was a generosity of spirit. They were refugees. They had been living in tents in Fort Chaffee for the, for the last three months. And they were living off of whatever, you know, industrial food or that they were able to feed them. And they found a way to make sure that they could take care of another family who was in the same situation. Sometimes we forget where we come from. I've got a, a young lady in my parish who who was married in a very, very difficult marriage, ended up, you know, having to uh, leave the guy because of very bad alcoholism, uh, was cleaning people's toilets to provide for her two children, you know, would make the kids split a happy meal. While she got nothing, the kids split a happy meal. She ended up marrying someone who's done very, very well and, you know, has been very prosperous, owns his own business. And you're not going to find a more generous person and a more giving person who does for anyone and does for everyone. Because, and I asked her, I said, Jenny, you're so wonderful. She said, she calls her by baby. She said, baby, I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be without. She said, she said, I enjoy giving more than they, they enjoy receiving. That's what the salvation event is really a, a, about. When we realize that God makes good on his promise, as we only have a few more days left until we celebrate Christmas, I want you to remember something. God will never be outdone in generosity. I'm not talking about how much money you're going to give to the church or to the needy at Christmas. God will never be outdone in generosity. Whatever you give, God is going to give it back a hundredfold. My grandmother, who was widowed at 33, used to always say, Habibi, Lebanese name for sweetheart, okay? Habibi, take care of old people and God will make sure that someone's always gonna be there to take care of you when you're old. And it's that same understanding that whatever we do for God, whatever we give for God, whatever we do for the least of our brother, not just at Christmas, and Christmas is a great time, and for all of you who are so wonderful and so generous during the Christmas season, here's a hint. 
You can have that feeling all year round. If everybody decided that there's one person who's less fortunate, maybe it's financially, maybe it's emotionally, maybe it's spiritually, maybe it's psychologically, but there's one person that I'm going to give back to. I'm going to take care for God. I'm going to look at this person as my responsibility to make sure that they're taken care of in their needs, their emotion, all this. I want to make sure that they know how, God, how good God is. As I wait for the Savior to come to the world, I'm going to make a commitment to be someone else's Savior. I'm going to be the Christ in that person's life. I'm going to be the one who throughout the year, I'm going to make sure that this person is helped and directed. And do me a favor. Be Christ to them. Don't do it for them. Teach them how to do it themselves. That's the mystery of this salvation event. He didn't come to say, here, baby, I'm going to do it for you. You sit back and let me do everything. He came to say, if you want it, this is how you do it, and I'm going to give you all the grace and all the help you need to achieve the holiness, to achieve the sanctity, to achieve everlasting life. Believe and keep paddling. That really was the gift of that salvation event. And if we want to bring the people who want to one day see the face of God, if we want to be those people, then we're the ones who bring the Savior to the rest of the world. The ones who may never end up in church, the ones who maybe are isolated at work, the ones in the neighborhood that everyone else thinks is weird, the kid in our class that everyone just kind of isolates. We've got great opportunities, not only to celebrate Christ coming to us, we've got a great opportunity to be the one to bring Christ to others, not just between now and Christmas, but for the rest of the year. That's how the Word become flesh and dwells among us, not only in the Savior, but in those of us who believe. We become the flesh of Christ, His hands, His heart, His ears, His presence. We truly hope that this Christmas is holy, and we understand what salvation means, and we understand how to bring Christ to the world. Thank you for being with us. May each day bring you closer to your walk with the Lord. God bless.